Okay, welcome to this tutorial. Today we'll be focusing on turbulence modeling within OpenFoam. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off, at least with the geometry that we had. If you recall from, from last time, we had a square channel. We were looking at laminar flow, uh, trying to characterize the friction factor for fully developed flow. So the, the, col the four columns that you see here are a summary of those results. We, we did two in IcoFoam. So with the IcoFoam solver, we did two with the simple solver. In the, in the case of the two IcoFoam, we simply just changed the mesh resolution. And then we took the, the fine mesh and, and ran a simple solver. And then we did it again with the same mesh, but we changed the tolerances in the, in the, uh, the FV solution file. So we changed those tolerances by a, a couple orders of magnitude. Um, and we found that you know all, all of these all of these parameters that we tweaked had an impact on the the final number that we get for this friction factor. And I want to I want to note that this this is actually the product of a friction factor and a Reynolds number, um, the number that we're reporting here. And uh, th I should also say that this is the Fanning friction factor. Um, if we if we take this and uh, we multiply it by four, then we're going to get what's called the, the Moody or the Darcy friction factor. So if you're familiar with a Moody diagram, the, the friction factor that's reported there is, is the Moody friction factor or the Darcy friction factor. And it's simply uh, four times the, uh, the Fanning friction factor. So we will make another row here um, because when we when we go to turbulence money we're going to do the same case with a square channel but we're going to look at, at turbulent flow so uh, we're going to look exclusively at this moody uh, moody friction factor which again is just four times the uh, previous results that we had And then we'll we'll make a column here for the uh, expected. Okay, so what we're going to do again is is the same geometry, but we're going to uh, include some turbulence modeling and the. The type of turbulence modeling we're going to focus on is the K epsilon model. And I want to keep my geometry the same, so the, the width and the height of my channel, which is going to keep my area and my hydraulic diameter constant. Um, and in order to change the Reynolds number, because right now we're at a Reynolds number of 10, so even if we turned on the turbulence switch, we're not going to get anything different because the Reynolds number is so low. So we want to be for internal flow, the, the transition happens around 2,000, so we're going to shoot for uh, 10,000. So in order to get that, we could change the geometry, we could change the velocity, uh, but I'm just going to change the viscosity by um, three orders of magnitude. And we'll keep the velocity inlet the same. And now my Reynolds number, just simply by changing the viscosity, is, is uh, 10,000. So we went from some fluid that was that was uh, very viscous to something that's much less viscous in this case. Okay, so we'll run the simulations. We will calculate this this uh, dp, uh, the the pressure drop over over some length, and uh, calculate our friction factor and compare to the uh, the theoretical. Okay, so all I need to do now is go to a terminal window, and I'm going to start with the old uh, folder that I had. We're going to use the simple solver again. And uh, I'm just going to copy this entire folder over. And we'll call this simple TURB for turbulent. And then I will go into this folder. And the first thing I'm going to do is remove all the results from before. and I'll get rid of those result files as well. 
And so all I'm left with is my zero folder, my constant folder, and my system folder. In the system folder, we've got uh, the control dictionary file, FV schemes, FV solution. We don't necessarily have to change anything there. That's not, that's not where we're going to specify we're running a turbulence model. But I am going to open up the dictionary, control dictionary file. And instead of saving every 50 time steps, I'm going to step that up to 100. And uh, in case these, some of these simulations take a, a, a while to, to run, then I'm going to um, only keep um, the most recent four folders. So if I go to five or six, then, then I will uh, get rid of the old ones. I'll only have the most recent four in there uh, at a time. And I'm not going to change the tolerances. I'll leave those as they are. Um, and the schemes, as far as uh, linear upwind, etc., I'll, I'll leave those as they are as well. Okay, so now we'll go into the constant folder. And we have this transport properties, which we're definitely going to need to change. Uh, this is our viscosity. We don't need any of this here. So instead of uh, 1 e to the minus 2, we'll go 1 e to the minus 5. We changed it by three orders of magnitude. Um, this is going to give us a Reynolds number of 10,000 instead of 10. And in the RAS property file, here is where we're going to specify that we want um, a certain turbulent um, approach, a tur turbulent model. So we're going to turn the turbulence on. Um, each turbulence model has a, a number of coefficients tied associated with it. And we can run, I believe in this version of OpenFOAM, there will be 14 or, or 18 different uh, models that we could put in, in this line here. If we're not sure, then we can just put a, a dummy variable in there. And then when we go to run this, it's obviously going to error, give us an error, but it's going to give us a list of appropriate models that we could put in that, in that line. Um, let me go into the poly mesh folder as well. And we'll look at the block mesh dictionary file. Right now it's a 40 by 40 by 100. Um, I'm going to change that down to something smaller just so we can run simulations quickly and, and illustrate some of the concepts here. Okay, so I'm going to recreate my mesh. And the mesh was created, no problem. I could open it up and, and it's not going to give me an issue. But when I try to run the simple foam solver, it's going to give me an error, like I said. This, and it says the RAS model, um, this dummy variable that I listed there is not valid. Here's 18 different um, inputs that we could put there that are valid. And we are, again, going to focus on K epsilon for the time being. Um, so we would come back into this constant folder and open up the RAS property file. And we need to put it, it's case sensitive. We need to put it exactly as it was listed. And now when I try to run the simple foam solver, it's, it's going to give me another error. And the reason for this is because uh, we'll, we'll go and look at the in the zero folder why this is the case. But we have um, we have a number of uh, variables that we need to provide initial conditions for. And up until now, we've only focused on pressure and velocity. And because in the previous scenario, even though we had these files in there, uh, we didn't use them because we said it was laminar, so it wasn't even looking for these files. Um, but because when the, with the k epsilon turbulence model we're solving two additional transport equations, one for k, one for epsilon, we need to provide conditions for both of these. And in the block mesh file, it was where we created the uh, the different the different uh, boundaries. So if you recall from the pressure, we've got an inlet, we've got an outlet, and then we've got a fixed wall. So everything everything fits in one of these three categories. 
and in velocity we would see the same thing our inlet outlet fixed walls but all these other ones um, the epsilon k the the magnitude of u um, the nu t which is the turbulent viscosity and this nu tilde which is not used in the k epsilon model but but used in some some others um, so for our intents and purposes of what we're doing here we don't need that file at all but if we open up one of those um, let's start with epsilon then we see that there's completely different boundaries specified and the reason for that is because we just blindly copied everything over from a uh, tutorial that is that is given in OpenFOAM so it was applicable for that tutorial but we since have modified it to be our square channel so we need to make sure this is consistent with um, the boundaries that we have the boundary fields that we have uh, that we specified so we've got inlet uh, we've got outlet and this upper wall and lower wall um, we can delete all these and instead of upper wall we'll call this fixed walls I think that's what we called it yeah and for now we're going to leave this as a wall function um, and what that means is that as we're creating the mesh for our geometry um, the, the turbulent boundary layer near a solid wall is very thin and if we want to capture all the physics there we need a very fine mesh uh, near any solid surface what the wall functions do is enable us to uh, put a function in the, in the place of that boundary layer so that uh, we don't we just basically need one cell uh, in the that, that covers the, the complete boundary layer and then we uh, we replace any calculations that we would need to do via our mesh uh, and, and many many cells uh, with this wall function and we will dive into the source code here in just a bit to, to help uh, to give you an idea of, of what this is where it's been calculated and um, how to tweak it if, if we need to okay so now our epsilon file is fine we also need to open the uh, k file and do the same thing here and change this from upper wall to fixed walls and we're going to leave this again as a wall function for the same reasons that we did the epsilon and the last file that we need to edit is this nut and we, we could delete these other two we don't need those but we will need the nut and we need to make sure it's consistent with how it is specifying the boundary fields and we've got a wall function here as well and so there is wall functions for each of these variables this one's called epsilon wall function this is the kqr wall function and this is the nut wall function okay so now all my all my files in the zero folder are ready to go and i should be able to run this without any errors I have a relatively small mesh, so as you see, it's it's running very quickly. And it's gone through um, all the iterations. It, it got done in 104 iterations, so because I changed it from 50 to 100, I should have a 100 folder and then a 104 folder. And we see that right there. Okay, so now I can go view the results. And you'll see down here I have a, uh, some additional fields. Um, I've got epsilon, and I've got k, and I've got the turbulent viscosity. And so I can I can specify that I want to apply all those. And now in my drop-down menu up here, I've got those additional fields that I could plot. So I've got velocity. and we come in at a uniform velocity of one meter per second and then at the outlet that transitions to something similar to internal turbulent flow velocity profile um, but I can I can take a look at the K so we come in at, at some 
with some kinetic energy inlet condition and then that transitions to something uh, very small at the outlet. Same can be said for epsilon and for the uh, turbulent viscosity. So with the turbulent viscosity we, we have some um, inlet conditions that, that we specified and these I guess rather we didn't specify it but we we told open foam to calculate this based on the inlet condition that we gave it for K and for epsilon and uh, the, the equation that we would use for that we'll we'll go over here in just a minute but um, at this outlet it's 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 worth noting that we have something that's very small in terms of the turbulent viscosity something that's very small near the um, near the solid surfaces um, and then um, is is higher here um, in the shear layer. And the reason for that is because as we get close to a surface then the only viscosity that's going to affect the diffusion transport is the uh, molecular viscosity and the, not the turbulent viscosity. So the value of the turbulent viscosity uh, tends to zero as we as we get close to a wall. Alright, so we could also take a look at the uh, the plot over the center line as we've done in the past. And we've got all the field variables that, that we specified uh, calculated here. We have epsilon starting out at some high number and, and, and transitioning down to something that looks very small. We can get rid of that to help visualize some of the other ones. The K is going to be the same. We start out at some inlet K and it, it uh, approaches some small value here. What, and what's happening with these with these turbulent statistics, the, these quantities that we use at the inlet, namely dissipation and the kinetic energy, um, if, we, if the pipe, or if the channel in this case, is long enough, then the inlet condition is, is going to be forgotten. In other words, if we have an infinitely long pipe, then it doesn't really matter what we specify at the beginning if all we care about is what's at the end. So in this case, um, We'll, we'll see as if we simulate um, a longer domain um, whether or not that that uh, inlet value that we specified really has an impact. Okay, but we can see uh, very clearly from this that the velocity is not what we would hope it, it would be. So we're looking for something that is, is fully developed. And if, if it's fully developed, that means velocity is no longer a function of position. And we're just plotting over the center line, um, but we should hopefully see something that reaches a steady state value uh, at, towards the end of our domain. Um, and so the, the main problem here is that the domain is, is not long enough. Okay. Um, Let's, let me show you one more um, function here. If we type uh, y plus ras, then that's going to give us values. It's going to go through all the, the folders that we have. So we have a zero folder, we have a, a hundred folder, and we have a hundred and four folder. So it's going to go through each of those and then calculate the minimum and the maximum and the average y plus where at all the fields, at all the surfaces, that uh, would be impacted by this, so all the solid surfaces. So you can see initially we have just a, y plus, a uniform Y plus everywhere of, of a little over 83, almost 84, and then as we get to the iteration 100, then this the minimum goes down to 13, the max is at 68, and then that doesn't change from times or iteration from 100 to 104, um, meaning we've we've reached uh, convergence. So what this means is that the wall functions that we applied uh, are, are more or less appropriate in this scenario, given the velocity field that, that we have at the, at the outlet and in the, in the entire domain, really. Okay, so um, let's actually take a look at this real quick. So if we, if we talk about the entry length for channel flow, then in laminar flow, it is going to be a function of the Reynolds number. 
and uh, the hydraulic diameter. In this case it's just D, but, but we can adopt this to our square channel and our hydraulic diameter in this case is going to be 0 0.1 meters. And before we had a Reynolds number 10, and so that would give us uh, 0.5 times 0.1, so we need 0 0.05 meters of length in order for it to reach a fully developed condition and uh, we had well beyond that and as you recall from the laminar simulations uh, we, we could have gotten by with something uh, a little shorter in terms of the the domain length. Uh, for turbulent flow this is this is different right it's no longer a function of Reynolds number it's simply going to be between 10 and 60 hydraulic diameters and so right now we we have uh, again a hydraulic diameter of 0.1 we have a we have a domain length of 0.5 so we're, we're sitting at five uh, hydraulic diameters in length and uh, so it's not even near the the bottom uh, cutoff of, of what we would expect here and these numbers should be taken with a with an enormous grain of salt There's, they're not they're not hard numbers necessarily they give us guidelines on which we sh should expect the flow to become uh, fully developed um, but we've, we've got to increase the the size of our domain the, the length of our domain Okay, so let's let's go ahead and do that. We're we're okay in the mesh, in in the in the cross-sectional dimensions. We have a, a 20 by 20 mesh that seems to be appropriate at least uh, at least now. So what we'll do is we'll come in here. And we're going to copy this over. Oh, one thing I want to show you real quick is, is if we go into one of these folders, let's go into the 100 folder. So now we have all these, uh, the same files in there, but we also have a, a Y plus file. So I could take a look at that and it's got the boundary values and then all 4,000 of these data points listed here. And so now when I go back and open up Paraview, oops, and then we find um, we have an additional field that we can Plot here, so we've got k epsilon and, and our our viscosity, terminal viscosity. But we also have this y plus. And I can plot the y plus. In this case, it would need to be the instead of the cell value, it would need to be the uh, variable here. So we can see um, on the surface of this, this is where our Y plus uh, we would be concerned with uh, at, this, at, at the solid surface then um, in this entry region is really where we would be concerned about it. Down here, uh, we, we obviously don't have any problem with, with Y plus, it's well below even 20 or so. Um, but if we're concerned about keeping a Y plus below a certain value, then um, this is the area in which we would want to do that. So for example, if if this was too high, then we could take the mesh in the axial direction and instead of having a uniform spacing, we could have something that starts out uh, very small mesh in the axial direction and then transitions to something uh, larger towards the outlet. And we could easily get away with that to keep a, a Y plus more or less uniform across the board. But for the intents and purposes of what we're doing here, this is this is perfectly acceptable. We don't necessarily have to change the, the mesh much. Okay, so now I'm going to um, I'm going to copy this folder and I'm going to change the size of the domain. So I'll copy my my channel flow. Turbulent to the 
let's call this uh, two for now. Let's see the copy. And I will go into that folder. And go into my block mesh dictionary. Oops, I could go with. And we had, um, again, a length that was five hydraulic diameters in length. Uh, we want to be at least ten, but we want to be between ten and, and sixty. So let's let's uh, let's just go ahead and just increase it by a factor of ten. And instead of 50 elements in the in the uh, axial direction, we'll change that to uh, 500. And we'll go create a new mesh. So now we have 200,000 elements, and we can. Uh, simply run the simple foam solver. Uh, what I'm going to do this time, instead of having it echo back to the screen, I'm going to create a log file. And so it's running in the background, uh, but it's not continually updating me in the terminal window of, of where it's at. But I can open up another terminal window And uh, once I start to see these um, extra folders appear, then I know I've gotten to, to iteration 100, 200, 300, and so on. Um, I also created a, or I, I downloaded a file that is that you can also download from the course website. Um, this residuals, so I'm going to copy this residuals into my my folder where I'm running these simulations. Oops. So I've got this residuals and if we take a look at it then it's basically just a script for GNU plot so that it that I can get a real-time plot of my residuals. So instead of trying to sort through the jargon that is echoed up until now, we've echoed back to the terminal window, uh, we can just simply write type GNU plot residuals and we can see the progress of them. So I'm I'm at uh, almost at iteration 100 so in, in just a minute I'll see another uh, file show up in my directory. So we can take a look at the um, the u and the x velocity or the, the x and the y velocity are almost almost identical. Uh, here's our z velocity, here is our kinetic energy, and then here is our epsilon and the pressure. So and, and it's useful to have this going in the background. Um, and the way that the script works is it's going to update every second. And so if I come in here and kill it uh, using Control C, then at any stage I can I can just bring it back up. And there it is. But I'll just show you I have I, n I now have a folder 100 as we would expect. So we'll let this run and uh, we'll pause for now and and come back in just a minute. Okay, so our simulation finished. Um, let me just type new plot to take a look at the residuals. They're no longer uh, changing. They've decreased to the level that meets our cutoff criteria that we uh, specified. Um, come back to the original terminal window. We can see that this uh, line is now finished, and we've got a 200, a 300, a 400, and a 416 folder. 
So let's go ahead and, and take a look at the results again. And I want to apply these conditions again. Actually, before we do this, let's go ahead and create a Y plus. Oh, well, let me let me also highlight the fact that I only have four of these. So, if you recall, we we specified in that we wanted to delete old files. Right. So we want to keep four, the most recent four, in there at a time. So this this did generate a folder at time step or iteration number 100 but is now gone because we told it we only needed the most recent four. So it's never going to delete the the initial folder but it's going to um, it's only going to keep four after that. So let's go ahead and, and uh, run the Y plus and this is going to then uh, create the Y plus files in each of the folders as well as, as tell us uh, what these values are. So we're still roughly about the same. We have a maximum around 68, minimum of, of 11. And uh, now when we go into pair view, we're going to have that Y plus as, a, as an option down here. And I'm just going to load all my files. So the domain now is slightly different. So we have instead of uh, something that is, f is uh, five hydraulic diameters in length, now we've got something that is 50 hydraulic diameters in length. And if we take a look at the velocity profiles, At our most recent time step, and again we come in at a uniform profile, and then we presumably reach a fully developed condition. The best way to judge that is to again look at the line data, the center line data through the through the channel. But I also wanted to take a look at the Y plus real quick. Oops. And so we see, just as before, the location of our, our highest Y plus values are going to be right at the near the inlet, where that, where that turbulent boundary layer is just starting to uh, develop. But again, it's not, they're not uh, overly, too, overly large. So in other words, we're not going to have to change the mesh if, if, if we don't, uh, if we find something that's acceptable in terms of uh, especially the metric of interest, in this case we're going to eventually calculate the uh, friction factor. So let's take a look at the centerline velocity profile, or the centerline velocity data. So I'm going to get rid of the Y plus here. And I'm also going to get rid of the epsilon just so I can see things a little better. Okay, so now here's our velocity profile, this, this uh, red one at the top. And as you can see, uh, it reaches a peak somewhere um, down here at uh, around, around 3 meters. And then by the end of our the domain, we are closer to a velocity, a centerline velocity of about 1.23, 1.24. So let's go ahead and calculate the uh, friction factor. Let's go ahead and first of all, let's save the data. Call this center line. And as we come here, we can open up this in LibreOffice.
here's our uh, viscosity. The, the one that we are most interested in is this uh, velocity profile and the pressure. So in fact, why don't we talk about the friction factor uh, a little bit more. For the, so this Moody friction factor, this is a Moody diagram, Moody chart. And uh, the friction factor that is defined as the quantity that you are seeing here. So it's the pressure gradient multiplied by our, our hydraulic diameter in this case, um, divided by this dynamic velocity. This is the average velocity, which we know is for any cross section in our case is going to be one meter per second. Um, so we know everything in here except for the dp, dp dz term. And as you recall from open foam, any pressure that's reported in these simulations is going to be a pressure di uh, divided by a density. So we, we're accommodating this density as soon as we pick off those numbers from the pressure data that open foam spit out. And although this is, this is a, a diagram for circular channels, we can take our hydraulic diameter and expect something very similar. And so we have, we're not modeling any surface roughness here, so we have a perfectly smooth pipe from a simulation standpoint. And our Reynolds number is within this range, we're at 10,000, so we can, we can use this expression uh, to help us predict what we, would, um, what we would expect for the um, friction factor. So down here we're going to take it, and so we have 0.79. parentheses here, 0 0.790 times the natural log of our Reynolds number minus 1.64 all raised to the negative 2 power. And so what we expect is a, fr a Moody friction factor of about 0 0.03. Um, I guess I should, since this is the product, I, I'm supposed to multiply this by the Reynolds number. So the product of our Reynolds and, and Moody friction factor is going to be about 315. So let's take our data. Actually, I'm just going to copy this over here. We'll get rid of some of these columns. Okay, so we have uh, the size of, of our of, of the cross section. Um, this is going to going to, was uh, ten e to the minus five. Oh, no, one e to the minus five. There we go. And now we just need to. Take off our pressure from this from this plot over here. Let's go back to pair pair view and just take a look at, at just that pressure data. And to verify, um, I'm, I'm sure it's fine, but I just wanted to visually verify that this is. Uh, linear, right? And, and we see that, that it is as soon as we get past um, maybe one meter, then the pressure looks very uh, linear. I guess we could have plotted that from our LibreOffice too, but so I'm going to take um, 
this goes down to five meters. I'm going to take something around uh, three meters. And this column was my pressure. And it should be zero down at the bottom. And indeed it is. So there's my pressure difference over the same uh, the same distance uh, the, the distance that it covered was uh, 3 minus 5 so so then my the PDZ here's what I expect it to be and the F times RE from the simulation is going to be equal to our friction factor which is just this dp dz and multiply that by our hydraulic diameter and divide that by uh, actually I'll multiply the numerator by 2 and then divide by velocity squared and I have to multiply that whole thing by my Reynolds number. So we're not we're not exactly what we what we expected, um, but it's it's one it's in the ballpark. Um, we can now look at maybe changing the mesh to see how sensitive this this metric is on the mesh. Uh, we could also play with the wall functions a bit um, instead of of using wall functions. For example, we could we could uh, just model it completely all the way to the wall. Our y plus values were, were fairly small. I mean, it, it's not, it's not going to take an enormous amount of work to create the mesh to, to be able to model all the way to the wall. Um, so that we have a good starting point here. Um, and the other thing we probably want to do is, is do one more simulation where the domain size is, is even uh, a little bit longer and just to verify that with the current mesh, cross-sectional mesh, and the uniform mesh in the axial direction, uh, a further increase in length uh, doesn't have a large effect on, on this number. And so we could do that. Uh, we'll, we'll do that next. But, uh, but first, let's take a moment and look at some of the source code here. OK, but before we do that, let's uh, take a look at some of these uh, slides just real quick. Um, just as a review, um, with the K-Epsilon model, we are solving two additional transport equations. One is for the turbulent kinetic energy, the one that you're seeing here. This is the one that we derived in class, um, and it's made up of the basically what is the material derivative on the left-hand side. We have a diffusion term, we have a production term, and a dissipation term. And the production is given by this expression, and if we know the kinetic energy and the dissipation, then we can calculate the turbulent viscosity. And so in the, in the code, if you remember in the zero folder, we had to specify new t in that file. We, we put calculated on each of those different um, boundaries, so the inlets, the outlets, and, and at the walls. So this is the expression uh, that, that OpenFoam would, would use to then calculate that turbulent viscosity for us. And here's a number of constants. Uh, this is taken as one, so you'll see that this is uh, not included in the in the OpenFoam definitions, uh, but obviously if it's one, it, it doesn't matter. Okay, in OpenFoam, the approach to modeling this is uh, the expression that, that you see below. This capital G is used in place of what we call uh, capital P, the production. The definition is the same, um, and there's a couple other slight nuances that I wanted to explain real quick. If we take this uh, magenta term and compare it to what's down here, it might not seem like it is exactly the same thing, but if we look at the uh, the the um, divergence of the velocity and, and the turbulent kinetic energy, it can be broken down according to the product rule. And if we solve this expression for the magenta term we see here, which is the magenta term we see up here, then we see we're left with 
this expression, which is exactly what is in the open foam uh, model. And the second term of this underlined uh, couple terms is zero if we're dealing with incompressible, which we obviously are. And so we, uh, we, we basically have the same equation that we derived in class for turbulent kinetic energy. And this uh, diffusion coefficient we're using an effective coefficient uh, in open foam. It's going to use the sum of both the turbulent viscosity and the molecular viscosity. And this enables us to have the same, uh, same model irrespective of whether or not we have uh, wall models accommodated in the, in the boundary layer or the, um, in the boundary file. So as we get close to a boundary, for instance, this is going to, uh, the, the molecular viscosity is going to dominate and this will disappear. Okay, in terms of the dissipation, it's uh, very similar. Um, we've got the, these terms broken up here. We've got an effective um, diffusion coefficient in this case, which is a sum, again, of the molecular and the turbulent viscosity. We have an additional term, um, additional three terms in in this uh, dissipation equation but again the 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 four terms the the four constants that you'll see uh, used in this k-epsilon model are the four here um, minus this um, sigma k and the Reynolds stress can be calculated according to the expression shown here um, this relationship is is uh, we, we arrive at this condition when we make the turbulent viscosity hypothesis and that helps us relate the, the fluctuating um, rate of strain tensor to the, the average rate of strain tensor shown here. And if we solve this for uh, Reynolds stress, we got the, the uh, minus sign multiplied through and then we're left with this expression here. So keep these in mind as we um, as we go to the uh, source code. And this source code can be found uh, if you go to the folder where OpenFoam is installed. Then we've mainly dealt in this, or we've looked into this tutorial folder where we've copied uh, files over to run them, to modify them and, and run some of the simulations we've done. In the folder SRC, this is your source code. Uh, you'll find uh, at the very bottom here, you'll find the turbulence models folder. And within there, we're going to go into the incompressible and into the RAS folder. And inside of here is the source code for all the different turbulence models that, is ava that are available in, in your version of OpenFoam. And so we've dealt uh, so far with k-epsilon. We'll go into the k-epsilon folder. And there's three files in there. We've got a C file. Uh, one of the first things that the C file calls is in the header file, header portion of the file is, is the .h file. And we'll see in this .h file there's a general description uh, reference to um, some of the, the text that you can read up on to get a better feel for this particular turbulence model. Um, we're establishing our model coefficients. We've got four coefficients and the fields which we're interested in, in calculating. So we've got two transport equations, again, one for kinetic energy, one for dissipation. And then we, we want to calculate our, our turbulent viscosity. And uh, we're going to define these effective coefficients here, similar to what we had uh, shown here. We have an effective diffusion coefficient for kinetic energy which is just the sum of our uh, molecular viscosity and our turbulent viscosity. And we have a similar coefficient for the epsilon uh, transport equation. And that expression is here, which is exactly what we showed on this slide here. OK, so if we go back to the, the C file, you'll see one of the first things that is done is to uh, list the coefficients. Uh, you can change those here, or you can actually create a file that, that modifies them as you run. Um, my advice is not to do that. They're, these these aren't chosen blindly. 
Um, they're, they're chosen based on fitting the uh, performance of this turbulence model to uh, certain key turbulent conditions. And uh, so it's, it's not, in, in, in my opinion, it's not wise to, to, to adjust these, uh, especially if you're just trying to fit your particular simulation with some experimental data. It may indeed work for you, but it's, it's, it has no physical meaning for anyone else. So here's the coefficients. Um, we've got the three variables, the k, epsilon, and, and nu t listed here. And if we scroll down, I want to scroll down a little bit to the, the uh, transport equation. So here is the dissipation transport equation, and just below it is the turbulent kinetic energy transport equation. Um, and if we compare this to what we had on our slides for epsilon, then we've got our, our DDT term here. And this, that's our first term here. This was zero because it's incompressible. Uh, we've got the divergence of the product of phi and epsilon. Phi in our case is, is our velocity vector. So that's this term here. And we've got subtract the Laplacian of the uh, effective diffusion coefficient in epsilon, in epsilon. That's exactly what we have here. And then on the right hand side, we've got these equals on the right hand side. Uh, we've got some, we've got our coefficients listed here. G again is the production term. And we've got a ratio of, of uh, epsilon over K. So that is this term here. And our final term is going to be a minus sign. We've got C2 epsilon over K. We're just, we're, we're, we're taking the product of, of, of these two quantities here. So epsilon over K times epsilon becomes epsilon squared over K. So there's our transport equation for uh, epsilon, for the dissipation. We've got something similar for the kinetic energy. We've got a DDT term, we've got a divergence term, we've got the Laplacian term with our effective, and then on the right-hand side, we've got our, our uh, production, which is capital G again, and we've got uh, this epsilon over K multiplied by K, and uh, which is, we're left with epsilon in, the, in that case. So here's, this is where the two transport equations are solved. Um, but before that, I want to draw your attention to a couple of lines here. This line here, um, line 238 in this case, is um, calculating G. So it's calculating the, uh, the production term. And so we've got our turbulent viscosity times two. Um, here's our production term here. So here's two and turbulent viscosity. And we've got the, uh, the rate of strain tensor here, this S sub IJ. Um, and if you take a look at what's inside these parentheses here, we're taking the, the gradient of U, and we're taking the symmetric tensor of that gradient, and that is going to give us um, the rate of strain tensor. So this whole thing here is our rate of strain tensor. And then this function here is just squaring it. So we have uh, two of these here. Okay, so there's our production term. It's going, to, it's going to calculate our production. And then this term here is going to make use of our wall functions. So the, the transport equations that we just showed, and which are below this, this line we're on right now, uh, are going to be solved for the, all the domain except for where, where we're going to implement wall functions. And uh, this, this line here, again, is going to update the production term and update the dissipation for that first cell next to the, or, or as many cells are next to the, um, next to the solid wall as, as, as are below some critical Y plus that, that, we, are, that we need to solve for. Um, so they're going to update those, and this, since we're solving the transport equation here, we're basically going to use those those updated epsilon values at the boundaries. That becomes those become the boundary conditions for solving this this PDE, which is our transport equation. Um, and I'll show you the the update equations here in just a minute. But at the end of this, we're then going to calculate our turbulent viscosity, and it's going to be defined according to this standard definition that we have here. Um, and then it's going to uh, update that in certain cells where the boundary conditions for the wall functions are applicable. 
And we're going to find these if we open up, if we go up a folder back to the RA, RAS folder, and if the, in the drive uh, patch fields folder, you'll see there's a wall functions. And within the wall functions here, we've got our epsilon wall functions, we've got our K wall functions, and we've got our viscosity, our turbulent viscosity wall functions. So for other turbulent uh, models, we've got other wall functions that we would implement. But for, for us in this K epsilon, those are the three folders that we'd be interested in looking at. So in our epsilon, We've got two options here, a uh, wall function, which is a high Reynolds number, and then the low Reynolds number option. We're using the high Reynolds number option here. And if we open up the C file for that, then the place where we update epsilon and our production term is, is found right here. And uh, I think I had another slide here. So here's what is going to happen in OpenFoam with this, with this modeling approach. For the condition where Y plus is between 30 and 100, then OpenFoam is going to first correct the production term, according to this expression, and is going to update the dissipation term. And then that very last, uh, the very last line in, in the k epsilon.c file where we are calculating viscosity. Here is the, the viscosity that we would use for that um, boundary condition uh, line. So if we look at the um, expression here for epsilon, we've got this W term, which is essentially, um, it's, so it, it's, it's used in, in, in the event that we have, have uh, in a corner, for instance. Um, we don't have any corners, so W is going to be 1 for every cell that we have. Um, but it's got this CMU75. If you scroll up a little bit, you'll see this is, is, a, is an equation to find according to taking this, the constant raised to the 0.75 power, which is, which is exactly what we have here. And then we've got... Um, Multiply that by the by k, take it to the 1.5 power divided by kappa, which is the von Karman constant, uh, multiplied by uh, our y value, which is the expression that we have here, and our our turbulent viscosity is going to be updated. Oh, I didn't. Uh, where's g? Okay, here's here's the g expression. So we've got uh, this w term again, and we've got uh, the sum of our of our wall viscosity and our or our turbulent viscosity at the wall and our molecular viscosity and we've got this uh, gradient the magnitude of the gradient of u at the at the wall we've got this c constant raised to the 0.25 power which was another line up here somewhere right here and uh, we divide that by cap and y square root of cap and y square root of k over cap and y. And so here's, in this file, we're going to update both epsilon and g. And if we open up the wall function for um, new t, you see here we have a number of options depending if we want to count for surface roughness or not. The most common one and the one that we are using for a nice smooth wall is listed here. And on line uh, 66 here, well, just before that's where we're going to calculate the y plus according to this expression. And then we are going to calculate this, uh, we're going to update the turbulent viscosity near the wall according to this expression here, which is exactly what we have listed on the slide here. Okay, so this is, this is the... Uh, one of the advantages of, of OpenFoam is to be able to uh, have the source code readily available. So if we have some update to the wall functions, for example, that we want to attempt for different scenarios, then it's just a matter of building those functions into the source material and uh, accommodating our, our analysis accordingly, um, which you may or may not be able to do depending on, on how how I guess complex you're trying to to implement this change, how complex of a change you're trying to implement rather. 
Um, so a lot of the commercial packages have user-defined capabilities, uh, but that there's a ceiling at which they they no longer can be used. And depending on what you're trying to do, you may or may not be able to use those. So this, whenever you have the source code completely available to you, like you do with OpenFoam, then you have that advantage. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and end this video here. Um, I'm going to create another video. We're going to revisit the square channel and do some additional analysis. Um, so look for a follow-up to that video um, as well.